All right, so it's 7.31, so I think I'm gonna get started. Um, it, it starts a little bit slow with some background information and some orientation information, and then we'll get into some of the things we should con consider for the, for the club to do. So let me, uh, let me share my screen and um, pull up some slides. <clears throat> As usual, I have probably too many slides, but I will try not to belabor any of them. And let me, um, as we go through, uh, I, think, uh, I think you have the option for entering chat or, or asking questions. But what I'll do is I'll take a break periodically and primarily ask people if, um, if they have anything they want to suggest or comment or question as we go through. So uh, what we're doing tonight is um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Eclipse 2024, basics for those who haven't looked into it in much detail at all, but just to, uh, to provide what I think are some of the key considerations for planning, especially for the people, which I think this group is, people who would like to observe it during totality. Um, talk about the survey results, which, are, uh, which were somewhat illuminating and uh, got a good return and then talk about possible things for Novak to do uh, to exploit the eclipse. And we're gonna talk about um, the scope of any effort that Novak might do, not, not answer all the questions or provide all the details about the eclipse and how to observe it, how to photograph it. That'll be for later. So in case anybody here doesn't know, why do we wanna to observe total solar eclipses? Um, there are some events, you get to meet interesting people. Um, some might say you meet the same kind of geeks that you are, but uh, the people who travel to eclipses are an interesting bunch. And you tend to go, get to go to places where you might not otherwise have traveled to. Um, some of the points to make are that in going to an eclipse, because you can't guarantee you're going to see it because of weather and other, other things you can't control, you might as well make it into a good trip. Uh, you're spending some time getting there and being there and coming back. So you might as well enjoy the, the, the getting there and the coming back uh, as much as you might enjoy, or almost as, might, as much as you might enjoy the eclipse itself. Um, as far as it being an awesome event, I think I went down the list. I have attempted to go to six eclipses starting in 1959 and when I was in sixth grade, and I've seen five of them, if I recall correctly. They weren't all great, um, but I have a pretty good track record. It's just that first one, which was a sunrise eclipse in Massachusetts, was totally overcast, and I still had a good time. So reviewing what this eclipse would be like, and by the way, I'm not going to talk about the, the uh, annular eclipse in 2023. Some people expressed an interest in that. The 2023 eclipse in uh, October might be considered by some to be practiced for the total eclipse, but seeing an annual eclipse is uh, not nearly the same level of interest and, and the need to be to the center line, I think, as, as a total eclipse. But the animation on the right is showing how it passes over North America. And the reason the earth is rotating the way it is and the shadow is moving, this is from the point of view of the sun looking at the center of the earth. So during the course of the eclipse, the earth will be rotating and the, move, and the moon will be going uh, in its ascending node across the uh, ecliptic um, from south to north. And therefore the shadow will go across the earth from south to north and tending from west to east uh, as the earth rotates in that same direction. So as you can see, it enters North America around Mazatlan in Mexico, uh, moves towards the northeast and uh, exits in the Canadian maritime provinces. Uh, we'll see a little bit more later, but uh, gen generally the cloud cover predictions are better in the southwest in the dry desert areas than they are in the east. 
Also, the eclipse parameters are better. The eclipse is a little bit longer. The path is a little bit wider. Uh, the sun is at a higher elevation, um, all of which make it a little bit better to observe all other things being uh, equal. Although it's generally desirable in any kind of an astronomical observation to be at a high elevation, unless wind is going to get you, um, this eclipse really doesn't pass over any high elevation, uh, except in Me Mexico and the Sierra Madre. Um, so there's not much of a differential there. Um, and Mexico, I think, is largely out of consideration as a place to go because of the uh, drug and violence problems they're having, especially in uh, Coahuila State, I believe it is, which is right across the border from Mexico at the point where it enters. Uh, Mazatlan would be a place, the eclipse goes right over Mazatlan. And I heard back from one member who's already arranged to be on the eclipse cruise that um, will be in the vicinity of Mazatlan. That's probably a safe place to go unless you want to take photographs because the shipboard is not a good place to get a still steady base. Uh, questions about that? Anybody? Okay, just move on. So here is the uh, uh, map of median cloud fraction predicted for April across the path. Uh, now you gotta be a little bit careful because weather statistics in general and cloud <coughs> statistics in particular are hard to interpret. 55% um, cloud cover, does that mean the whole sky is covered by thin clouds or half the, cloud, the sky is covered with thick clouds? Uh, or something else. And this is also median. So where it says 40% median cloud cover, that doesn't tell you how much is totally clear and how much is totally opaque and how much is partial. But certainly the statistical cloud coverage from whatever meteorological observations are made tend to be better in the Southwest than the Northeast. In the discussion, um, after I sent out the survey, there were a lot of people who told, uh, who told about anecdotes of their weather experiences in Texas and their weather experiences in Buffalo. And certainly you can have a beautiful day in Buffalo uh, in April, and certainly you can have an overcast day in Texas in April. And you only get one chance, you only get five minutes. And it, what matters is what the clouds are above you, mainly during that four or five minutes. And there are no guarantees on any of that, unless you go to some place which is absolutely dry, like the, like the deserts, and then you have a very high chance of clear skies. Um, well, you know, even if it's dry, you have to worry about dust storms. Well, that's something dust else. Dust I had, I had quite, so I just, you know, just wanted to throw that in there. It's, it's, it's not, it's no good anywhere. You know, you're not going to have a guarantee anywhere you go. <laughs> Oh, that's right. And you can, and, and um, I've experienced dust storms in Texas too, even in Austin. Um, it was surprising, but it's, it wasn't a condition that you'd like to have your optics in. That's for sure. Um, and, and there are other non-meteorological considerations. But here's the path. Now, the other big consideration is how hard does it get to? Um, here is roughly the pure drive times based on Google that I was able to pick up. And uh, eight hours is a hard, di hard day of solid driving because your actual elapsed time is something more than eight with stops and uh, with construction and with traffic. But these are sort of optimal. But basically you're a day away from anything from Fort Wayne, uh, Indiana to, um, uh, northern New York to the uh, um, Adirondack Mountains. You're two days away from uh, the Ozarks and you're three days away from central Texas um, of, of straight through driving. And um, like I said, that's, that's hard, consistent driving. If you do anything in the way, along the way, which you should do, it's going to take you longer than that. So 
getting to Texas would be more than a three day drive. Of course, if you're gonna get on a plane, it doesn't matter so much. Uh, you get to all these places in about the same time. It's the time it takes you at the airport, getting there and getting out. But then you have to make arrangements for a car um, unless you're gonna stay in one of the cities that it passes over. So um, there are a lot of personal considerations about cost and the time you can commit and how much flexibility you wanna have and where you go uh, that would influence how you, how you, uh, how you arrange it. Uh, I think if I had my druthers, I'd aim for Texas west of San Antonio and I've been looking at places there. If it turned out I didn't have as much time as that, I think I'd be heading to Cleveland because uh, that is just about literally the closest drive time to Washington. And it's probably no worse than most of the other things between Illinois and, and New York. Uh, and it, it passes along the coast of uh, the shore of Ohio there. And there are a lot of, a lot of parks and beaches and, and public areas which would be available for observing. So, Alan, um, the yes. thing you got to remember about Cleveland is Great Lakes, influence from the Great Lakes. They have their own weather system up there. So the right. chances of having a heavy cloud cover over Cleveland is pretty high. I mean, think of lake effect. Uh, Cleveland, Buffalo, all that area up there. Myself, the track, if I was going to be, be in Ohio. Already baked into this median cloud model? I, mean, I, I don't think this model has the detail. Um, and I think, well, I think it was Bob Bungie who pointed out there can be a local lake effect that actually clears clouds close to the shore. But that depends on the relative heating of the lake and, and the ground. I have, a, um, I have a slide since you brought it up in backup. Here's, um, on the right, it shows Lake Okeechobee with um, wind from the Northwest, wind from the Southeast, uh, and how the, the normal diurnal cloud cover was actually cleared by passage over the lake. Now, this was at a time of day when the lake was, I believe, cooler than the land. And you get that effect. I don't know if you'd get the same effect off of um, off the Great Lakes in Cleveland. And maybe getting closer to the event, people from that area will tell us their experiences and what local meteorology is, is like that time of year. Yeah, I lived in uh, that area uh, for a while. And um, yeah, that, that I, I would not recommend Cleveland. <laughs> I did live in that area and it, it can get pretty interesting. <laughs> well, is early April really considered the warm season in Cleveland or do you have to wait until May, late May to start getting or into August. that too? <laughs> yeah, or August. Well, that would be like Minnesota, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I have no idea. I, I haven't gotten into that. And um, that might be that. I mean, that's a that's a good topic for somebody on this online to delve into and report back to the club on what people say or what people have in the statistics for actually the cloud cover close to the lake. If that's preferable or you need to get away or it's just it's it's not going to work out in that area. And does it actually get better if you move to the southwest away from the lake? Uh, I can't believe it gets any better towards Buffalo. And, uh, uh, I guess, was that Lake Ontario? Um, that, that's just getting systematically more and more cloudy. But the, but the lake effects in Cleveland would be, would be interesting to know. Now, when you say you were in Cleveland, were you actually on the lake or were you inland from there? 
I was just south of the lake in a little place called Lorraine, Ohio, is where yeah. I was. Yeah. 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 Line, so pretty yeah, close line, to the lake. The line yeah. goes right over the old steel mill in Lorraine. Oh, it does? <laughs> yeah. 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 And always think prevailing easterlies. So that's where it's going to <laughs> Easterlies? Well, uh, wind so from yeah. west to east. From Maybe, west to east. east. Yeah, yeah, westerlies, I guess, really, the prevailing westerlies. Yeah, winds from yeah. west to east. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's where you got to think. Uh, down in southern Ohio, it can be fairly good. But, yeah, I'm like you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to head for Kerrville. <laughs> if, if I could jump in here, we're, we're kind of beginning to dig pretty deeply into this. And, and I think one of the things uh, Phil mentioned to Phil Harrington mentioned to us last Sunday is that all of these weather projections are historical profiles for areas. And to kind of the point Sue made earlier, you know, I, I went to one total eclipse in Aruba. It was only projected 10% probability of clouds. It was pouring rain an hour before the eclipse, fortunately it cleared in time for the eclipse. I was in uh, Nashville 2017 and uh, it was about uh, about a 50-50 chance. And we had perfectly clear skies. My wife's cousin, who was 30 miles away from us, was totally <laughs> clouded out. So, you know, you, you, you look at the regional average weather historically, but the day of the eclipse, it could be a totally different song and dance. Yeah, right. weather, and weather's my, a crapshoot. <laughs> yeah, my, my take on that is, um, and, and we, we dealt a lot with this in doing some planning I was involved in. Climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. But you only get one case of weather. And in planning where you're going to go, it's best to rely on climate because that's the best indicator you have until about two or three days beforehand. Now, um, some people have commented what they're going to do is have two reservations. They're going to fly, I think but they're gonna have two reservations, maybe 600 miles apart and um, decide just at the last minute, which reservation to, uh, to use. Now they may end up giving up uh, their deposit on the other, but if you have enough money, that's the kind of flexibility you need. So you can go to multiple places. You have the choice of multiple places once the weather forecast starts getting in some way reliable, uh, which is typically two to three days in advance, um, unless there's some strange weather, weather system coming in. Um, but I did wanna make another comment about moving up and down the path for weather avoidance. Um, and this is probably not a bad time to bring it up. And that is while the 2017 eclipse was at a descending node for the moon. So the eclipse path was basically going northwest to southeast. This one's going southwest to northeast. And that tends to be the direction that weather fronts occur in. And um, if I go to my backup on that, here's, here's the weather from April 6, this past year, um, the weather map. And um, what you'll see is this front that's going basically through Texas, Southwest, Northeast, which tends to mean that the, cloud, the clouds in here would have trended Southwest to Northeast. And you couldn't escape them by heading from San Antonio to Dallas you'd be in the same weather system. Whereas with the 2017 eclipse, where you, um, your trend was this way, if, if you happen to start out here, you could head this way or that way and get away from the front. If you start out here, you can't get away from it. Uh, and also, by the way, on April 6th, it was hot in Texas. It can get really hot down there. Um, and hot and dry lends to those dust storm conditions. So, um, yeah, we may, have, we may have less flexibility to escape unless you go a thousand miles away, not, not a few hundred miles away, uh, to get away from a weather system this time around. 
comments? Okay. Back to the regularly scheduled program. Let's see. Okay, so that's a discussion of the path. Oh, we talked about a lot of these things. Visibility and duration. The maximum duration of this eclipse is just about um, four minutes, uh, 27 seconds, I believe, uh, in central Mexico. And it doesn't get much shorter than that as you head northeast. It's down to about four minutes when you get to the um, uh, upper Midwest uh, Cleveland area. Yeah. Uh, so you lose about 30 seconds out of four and a half minutes, which isn't that bad. But the sun is getting lower in the sky as you move that way. So it becomes, it doesn't get very low until you get to uh, New England and the Maritimes. Um, Alan, before talk, you go too far, can we go back to the, the path? for just a second. Sure. Cause you mentioned trying to gain elevation. I was just looking at that map and thinking, well, what about upper New York state or Vermont or New Hampshire? Aren't you in mountains there? Um, well, you're, you're in the white mountains here in, I'm sorry, let me get the, you're in the white mountains here, but those are cloud, captures. Okay. That, that's, so you're not high enough to avoid. Yeah, I don't I don't think that's good. You get some elevation here in the in the uh, well in the Berkshires and in um, the Adirondacks. But it it's not like you know 2017 I was in Idaho and I was at 7000 feet. You're not going to get that. Um, you're not okay. going to get I don't think any kind of visibility, any kind of elevation which will significantly improve the visibility. Um, you got the Ozarks here. You've got the Texas Hill Country here, which uh, is maybe yeah, two thousand yeah. feet. Um, and and I I can't tell you how to anticipate what the uh, what the local microclimatology of those places might be. So I don't think the elevation is is that much of a help, uh, okay. as long as you stay away from. Uh, bodies of water that might contribute to clouds, especially later in the day. Okay, thank, okay. thanks for that explanation. Yeah. Alan, we had a question in the chat asking about whether you had any more detailed information about the cities or towns to the west of San Antonio, Austin, Dallas. Uh, yeah, um, I've I've got some uh, I've got some the slide the slide at the end has some references. I'm not going to go into um, into details about those places because there you're in a, an issue of um, you can look at the map and see how close you want to be to the um, center line. Um, well, let me talk about this slide, and um, and that gets to some of those issues about specific locations. But I'm not going to talk about specifics. I'm going to talk about, talk about the considerations. So we talked about cloud cover, um, mentioned dust, and unfortunately, these now we have to worry about smoke from uh, range fires and, and forest fires that could come up as early as April uh, in 2024. Microclimo re climatology relates to the uh, the hill structure and whether anything forms there, I, I don't know. Um, maybe some meteorologists would know the details of some of these areas. Uh, elevation we talked about. Light pollution is generally not a problem. Uh, during a total solar eclipse, unless you're very high, it doesn't get very dark because um, there's a place not more than 100 miles or 50 miles away from you that's in sunlight. And um, that's way worse than a full moon. So you're gonna get scattered light from the area around the shadow. That means it's not going to get totally pitch black. Uh, and therefore local sources of light pollution 
as long as they're not shining in your eye or in the telescope, whatever you're using, um, are not generally a problem. I'm not going to look for a Bortle uh, one sky or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I was just would like to make one comment, uh, and this is really when you're looking at specifically where you want to be. If if you're going to be anywhere like in a large parking lot or a, or a park with a field with light, you have to make sure that the whoever owns that thing place is going to shut off the the lights. You know, and a lot of street lights and other things automatically come on when it gets dark. That that could be a real problem. So, um, you know, just another consideration, you know, not generally, you know, what part of the country you're going to go to, but when you get really specific, where you want to observe. That's exactly what I was going to say was that my experience in 2017 was we did it in the parking lot of Hampton Inn and we worked with the management and the management was actually very clued into the fact that they were expecting the lights to come on. And so they they made an effort to make sure that those high powered lights that they had for the parking lot were turned off. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good consideration. Um, I've never gone to a, to a public place like that. I've always been out, outside of town, so to speak. And that's a, that is a consideration when you decide if you're going to stay at a hotel along the path and not get a car or something, then you're going to be dependent on the kind of uh, conditions which that place offers you or someplace you can walk to nearby. Um, I'd think more about getting out into the countryside. And I did want to add with relates to the light pollution, one of the considerations in, in making it a trip, uh, especially if you're going someplace isolated is to go to a place that has dark skies. As long as you brought your telescope, you might as well look at the sky. Um, hopefully it'll be clear the night before, the night after, whenever you're there. Uh, and enjoy and enjoy a good location. Um, okay, and that relates to the second column of, of items, which is um, how much flexibility you have to relocate if you decide you want to try to do that uh, in short terms, in, in the short time before the eclipse comes when you have a forecast. So whether or not you have your own car, whether or not there's a, a good road structure to get you someplace else. Um, and that would be a good road structure that nobody else knows about, which I don't think exists. Because people have said, well, I can always get on I-35 if I don't like the weather forecast in, uh, in Austin and go up to Dallas. Well, you and three million other people are going to have the same idea. So um, it's not clear how much flexibility you get the day of. Uh, and there are some parts of Texas, which we've had some comments and discussion, they already have bad traffic jams, even without an eclipse going on. Um, another consideration when you decide where you're going is how much equipment do you need to bring for what you want to do and what kind of travel arrangements are you going to have for that? Is your car big enough if you share your car? If you take a plane, what can you, what can you bring on the plane? Or what can you ship ahead? Um, that's often a constraint. And finally, of course, the accommodations you have. Uh, are you gonna to try to be at a place that's where you would observe or be at a place that allows you to get to where you'd like to observe uh, and set up with enough time? Uh, that's what I did in in 2017 and actually worked well, although I had to make some ad hoc changes, but I was basically four hours away from my observing site that still worked um, because I couldn't get accommodations closer. So these are just considerations. Um, logistics of observing, this is sort of the continuation, uh, deciding what you want to do. And I think, I think we hope to talk about what you can do to observe and what you can do to photograph in um, subsequent meetings. What kind of preparations can you make before you leave? What do you need to do once you get there? And to practice with what you have when you get there, where your power supplies are, where your neighbors are, where the street lights are, and becoming familiar with the equipment you bring to the eclipse because sometimes 
people bring different equipment or a different configuration of equipment than they would be using at home. Um, getting to remote sites, allowing for traffic delays, um, having to rely on everything you bring, especially if you're camping or uh, making sure that you bring spare equipment, spare nuts and bolts and screws um, for your telescope mount, because you may not be near a Home Depot or a, or a McAll or McMaster to get, uh, to get replacement hardware. And of course, uh, everybody has a different constraint on how much time they can spend and how much they're willing to spend. Uh, anybody want to talk about these items? We'll get I into just said, don't forget water, food, and some kind of preparation, a portable toilet or something, if, if you are out in a really remote area. Well, if you get really remote, you don't need a toilet. You can. Yeah. Although the, bu the bushes in Texas are sort of small to hide behind. You know, but it's something to think about. Are you oh, going to yeah. be? Are you going to be near a place where you can, you know, use a, have access to a porta potty or not? So yeah, it's and something to check and, out when you. And, and eclipse is probably an eclipse is probably not a good time to start being a camp, unless you're uh, familiar with what to do. You don't want the stress of camping on top if, if it is a stress for you. You don't want the stress of camping on top of the need to be ready at an exact time. There's no do-over in solar eclipses. Um, they start on time, they end on time, and that's all you get. And that's something you have to really remember. So you need to really be prepared the day before. Um, and I uh, will. Uh, what's that? I will offer a, a comment about the preparing practice. I had set up for 2017. I had a, a, a nice battery set up and uh, ready to roll on that. And then the uh, the morning of the eclipse, the hotel I was staying at ran power lines, uh, uh, power cords out to where people were setting up. And so I thought, well, instead of running on the battery packs, I'll just go ahead and plug in. And uh, uh, shortly before we reached... Uh, uh, the the uh, the, the uh, first well second contact uh, one of the Brits who was in the crowd went into the hotel and he had made the comment that someone mentioned earlier about they had street lights and he says is there any way you can make sure these street lights don't come on so they <laughs> decided the only way to do that was to cut all the power and so you know here I am tracking and 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 everything and all of a sudden you know, I've got a go back and rehook up my battery pack. Now I had practiced, I was completely set up for the battery pack, but I wasn't, you know, practice on unplugging, replugging and adapting over. If I'd stayed with my original game plan, it wouldn't have been a hiccup for me, but you know, uh, when you practice a plan, stay with it. <laughs> yeah, the, and the lesson is use shore power to recharge your batteries. Yeah. Keep them charged. Good point. Okay. Well, I think that's also an argument in favor of, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to hook up with other astronomers wherever you're going, because, you know, then you all know what, what the story is, what the deal is, whereas a random hotel is with, and you're just one guess of hundreds, they're, they're not going to have a clue about all these different things. That's right. If, if you and your buddies all go off line at the same time you know it's just not your equipment it's uh, yeah something else that's a good point too okay now i want to go over the the survey results um as i have them and it, it, uh, nothing too profound in this one um as it shows there i got 52 actually got more responses than that some people sent emails and didn't respond actually to the form, but that's fine. But there were 52 to the, uh, to the survey form. So you can see that um, about two thirds of people certainly plan to go, but don't have arrangements. Another uh, one, one eighth have, um, uh, are considering going uh, a little bit more than an eighth and 
have uh, firm plans already. Those are the well prepared and, and uh, a small number are still trying to decide, which is fine. Uh, actually, no, absolutely nobody was just interested in hearing more about the eclipse, but not planning on going. So that was that was fine. Um, this is a little bit more interesting um, about what people are interested in. And I tried to to gear the uh, the slides to this. Um, and more than one more than one answer was permitted in this. That's why they don't add up twenty percent. Um, so obviously most people are interested in figuring out where to go. Uh, and that's why I've tried to talk a bit about that in the first part. Um, we, ha we have people um, who are interested in astrophotography, um, more moderate than um, probably a lot of uh, the general amateur astronomers. And that, that may well be prudent because uh, taking solar eclipse photographs can be tricky. And one of the major warnings is don't get yourself in a position where you spend all your time looking at the camera and not looking at the eclipse. That is a beginner problem and it's, it's very easy to do. So especially if you're going for the first time, make sure you spend the time to look at the eclipse itself and then worry about the camera. Now, one of the things we'll get into when we talk about photography is there are programs now in which you can plan out the entire control of your camera in advance and, and have it run automatically. But um, real foot stomp is be prepared to look at the eclipse first and then take pictures. So that's an interest. Um, some people are interested in general information about the eclipse, I'm trying to provide that too. And finally, uh, 12 of you, uh, um, some, some who are online right now, um, have offered to uh, to contribute uh, to the discussion. And uh, I hope we'll hear more from, we, we've heard already from some of those. Okay, I see that um, there's some questions that have come up in chat. Pamela, can you give me a-, a, a uh, it's, mainly, it's mainly a discussion. I don't think there are really any questions. There's oh, okay. a side discussion okay. going on. That's fine, okay. I just, um, I'm thinking it would be good in, in, in the planning for the club is to find out what efforts are being made by various organizations to support the eclipse. In 2017, we were in the North uh, in Tennessee and the Tennessee state parks were really ready for it. And so if you're looking for a place to go, that was a good choice, but you didn't know they were doing it until you got into Tennessee and, and ended up at the park. If you lived there, you would have seen T-shirts and stuff all over the place. But that was just a thought that the information to gather on what kind of support would be available other than some ad hoc farmer's field. Okay. Would you be willing to do that? Oh, you got me, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's one of the purposes of this meeting. Uh, uh, because I'll, I'll give a shot and scream for help if I need it. What's that? I said, I'll give it a shot and scream for help if I need it. Okay. Yeah, send me, send me an email um, as, as a reminder that this is going on. But I think that's something, uh, I know um, somebody pointed out that Fredericksburg, Texas is, um, is already organizing things. There are cities who will be organizing things. Yeah. Um, I think your suggestion that some state parks systems will be doing things. Um, in some cases, they're they're staging, I've seen uh, some places who are staging their campground and, uh, and RV parking arrangements, in some cases making them available more than a year in advance um, with the expectation they'll sell out. Um, and probably some towns who will be organizing RV parks um, in places where they wouldn't normally be allowed just because they want, they want to get that business. So um, yeah, it's a good idea. And yeah, I, I do want to try to point fingers and name names to get people to, to do these things. And we'll talk in a little bit about um, how to share the information. Okay. There's, there's some good comments being made in the chat and we'll make sure to make the chat text available to everybody. 
Yeah. Now, I check the Texas state park system out of curiosity. They're already prepared for the annular eclipse and that's their focus right now. But I think they'll be pivoting to the total eclipse sometime this year. So, but I think they're, they're gonna be like the Tennessee parks were, they're gonna be prepared and ready. Yeah, there were, um, I, I didn't, I didn't pull anything on this, but the American Astronomical Society um, has tried to organize, I don't know whether to call them influencers or, or what, but they've been trying to do outreach at the organizational level and make sure that places along the eclipse path are aware of the potential influx of people such that there can be intelligent planning all around. Um, and there have been community meetings for organization managers uh, for more than a year already. So these places, uh, these places will be informed and they'll be advocating for people to come to their town because the people who observe the eclipse bring money. And uh, especially April is a time of year when a lot of these places don't get a lot of tourists. So it's... Uh, it's uh, easy extra money if they can get, Alan, get on the bandwagon. Yes, Paul. Uh, it, uh, it also, one thing is that there's millions of people who are going to be wanting to watch the eclipse. So uh, hotels and campgrounds are going to fill up very, very fast and a long ways before the actual time of the eclipse because people are going to be thinking, well, I better go get a room now, you know, six months ahead. So that's that's one thing to definitely take under consideration is we need is is if you're going to go, you need to choose a place very, very soon and make your appropriate reservations if you're planning on spending the night, because otherwise things are going to go fast. <laughs> I wanted to pull up this chart, which shows uh, it's it, I, I take it as being a little bit misleading uh, because of what it did, but it did the best it could. It shows the closest place along the eclipse path to from every place in the country. So green is green is um, is roots that end up in Texas, and you can see that all of California, New Mexico, Arizona. Uh, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma. Um, the closest place to observe will be in Texas. And these dots show the relative number of routes that, that end there. Now, if I'm coming from San Francisco, I could, I could go here almost as well, but um, it shows the potential influx along here. And this is too small for you to read, probably. Um, Basically, they have a factor of four between the low estimate and the high estimate, but it shows Indiana getting anywhere from 145,000 people to 581,000 people coming in. And, um, and I think one of the reasons Indiana has so many is because Chicago is closest there. Um, people from Florida, people from the mid-Atlantic going up this way. So this, um, this would anticipate a lot of people traveling to some of these places along the center line. Um, I'm curious, course, does, does that also take into account foreign visitors who fly into say New York or LA or someplace or is it just American citizens? Uh, no, because I, this seems to be entirely a, uh, a roadmap based number. So uh, it also, well, it also doesn't count the number of Canadians who will be coming across the border right. to see the eclipse. Um, so there are a lot of things that doesn't do, but it's just indicative of the kind of potential demand with a well, with a well advertised eclipse with people either remembering or being told how successful 2017 was uh, the kind of influx. So yes, you've got to get your uh, 
reservations in early. And I think a lot of places you need to be prepared to, um, to have non-refundable deposits, uh, especially resort kind of places, because they don't want people canceling two days before the eclipse and thinking they're going to get their money back because it's cloudy. I mean, if I were running a hotel, I wouldn't allow that. Okay, back to... Okay, the third survey, survey result was, um, and this was a little bit surprising um, because 80% of the people said, yeah, they can, they can take care of themselves, which is expected. 42% um, of the people um, thought they'd like to join up. And I, I think the way I worded it, it was, it was mainly for travel, uh, but it also presumes you'd be sharing some resources in a, a hotel or a, or a cottage or something like that at the far end. Um, I was a little bit surprised, 36%, 18 people. Um, if, if they understood my intent, um, they were willing to sort of allow somebody to make arrangements for them and they would just uh, pay for the, for the person's effort as well as for the cost of going. So uh, a mini tour guide kind of situation, I think, or maybe renting a van and traveling, you know, like a 10 person van and traveling together. Uh, I didn't specify what it would be, but people would seem to be willing to um, let someone else do the work and, and compensate the person for their effort. And then there were a couple of other side comments that didn't conflict with that. Comments? Okay. So that's sort of what I got out of the survey results. I'm sorry, Alan, as yeah. far as comments are concerned. A couple things about uh, accommodations. I, I hope not to beat a dead horse here, but uh, I started calling around uh, in the fall to see if anyone in Kerrville or Fredericksburg or any of those places that had a chain hotel like a Hampton Inn or something would accept reservations. And the answer I got was that they'll only accept it one year in advance. The experience I had after looking at the map and looking for a place that had better, meaning less chance of cloud cover was a place a little bit north, uh, I guess, northwest of Austin called Lampasas. They had a Best Western, which has a 1-800 reservation number, but I chose to call, and I've mentioned this before, so I apologize for those who've already heard it. I chose to call the uh, hotel directly and they were willing to make the reservation that far in advance. I saw a note here about Hilton, and I'm a Hilton <laughs> guy. It says they allow you to cancel as little as a day ahead of time. That varies pretty dramatically depending on if there's an event near that location or what time of year, that sort of thing. It can be as many as uh, two days, four days, or a week, and it's often driven by the hotel itself. Uh, and we actually stayed in the Hilton property in uh, Riverton, Wyoming, at the, at the Hampton Inn that I was talking about earlier. And what they did was they just charged outrageous prices. And uh, fortunately, I had some points, and the points were much more reasonable than the dollars were. So I was able to mix points and dollars and, and afford the stay there. But yeah, they do fill up pretty quickly. Oftentimes you run into the problem of not being able to um, uh, reserve a room uh, more than a, a year in advance. Those that get clued in about the eclipse often will adjust their policy, but that also usually means that they raise their prices. So it's, it, it, I hate to say it, but it's really kind of a case by case basis and uh, a little research on your own, taking a look at, at Google, seeing what hotels are in a particular location that looks good to you is, is probably very helpful. The last thing I'd like to mention is, I think attending with other folks is tremendously rewarding. 
you may have a very cool spot out on your own, out in the middle of nowhere, but you don't get nearly the camaraderie or the excitement or the experience that you do if you have a bunch of people. The only downside to the bunch of people is if you work at your own pace in putting together your stuff and you have a routine, there's a chance that other people might interrupt that. But uh, that's where practice comes in and being able to stay on your game. It's sort of like someone blowing a horn in your ear when you're trying to shoot a free throw. You, you, you got to practice uh, enough times that that, that kind of distraction isn't going to bother you. But it's a great deal of fun if you have a crowd. Yeah, on, the, on that latter point, um, even people who think they're cool, calm, and collected will have a reaction at the beginning of totality, and um, which may be distracting, which is another reason to not expect to be going through your carefully planned schedule of, of photographic exposures that uh, you need to, uh, to allow a minute for the excitement to die down. But I also agree that uh, there's a lot of camaraderie. Um, in, in 2017, um, I, I ended up on a, on a hilltop with about a dozen other people, all who were very nice and cooperative and shared stuff. And somebody didn't have enough uh, Eclipse uh, filter material. And I had extra, so I was able to provide it. And, and they provided some, uh, some battery power for me. Um, in in uh, going to Southern Mexico before it was a problem in, in 1970, I ended up on a mountaintop with a couple of um, uh, weather experts who had come there from a place about 15 miles from where I started in Cambridge. Um, and we, we both traveled 2,000 miles we all traveled 2,000 miles to that same mountaintop, and um, and they were great people too. So yeah, you meet good people, and I think and it's a little bit of a maybe a bit of a conceit, but if you go to a little bit out of the way place, not just downtown, uh, in whatever place you are, you're more likely to meet up with the more adventurous types, who are um, who are looking to get away from the crowd. Although the crowd can be fun too. Uh, could I throw in something on uh, possible accommodations? Sure. <clears throat> now I was talking with, uh, with Carl Batts, who is the guy that leads the Texas star party this morning and on a couple of things. And he mentioned that uh, he is actively seeking input from people who want to come to the eclipse down in, in Texas and that they have a, a site, a uh, big, huge grass field that'll accommodate I don't know, three or 400 people or so camp, I think camping, and then some nearby possible lodging. And what he's trying to get input on is if someone came there, would they want to stay a day or two days or six days? He's trying to, you know, figure out what the parameters are that they can set up pretty soon within the next, I don't know, month or so, and then open it up and start uh, uh, setting up so that people can have that as an option. Um, I told Carl that we could put him in the... Uh, Novak, uh, 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 the Novak Astro Travel SIG, and people could just give him feedback there, and he could list in there what uh, he's looking for, and there can be some dialogue there. And if you're interested, the site would be near Waco, and he said the field is where there's totality. So, you know, if the weather cooperates and the and the stars align and all that stuff, there's a possibility. And if you want to um, talk to this guy, you know, he puts on the Texas Star. <laughs> They do a pretty good job. He also said they are considering moving the next year's Texas Star Party, the date, back to the eclipse, and they might even overlap through to that too. They're still in discussion on that. They haven't made that decision final yet. Just a couple of things to throw out. Yeah, why don't you why don't you put his name and in, in URL in the uh, in the chat? We'll capture it there. He doesn't have a URL or, or a um, email, whatever. Email, yeah. Or uh, contact information, whatever. Yeah, he he would like to do the discussion on the SIG, the the travel SIG. Fine. Okay. So if you're not in the travel SIG, just send an email to uh, SIGs at m.novac.com. We'll put you in. Okay, we're going to proceed. 
Um, okay, so th this is a preliminary list of how NOVAC members might help each other. Um, many of these things are, are things we talked about already. Uh, people could travel together, especially since there was some indication that people would like to do that um, to get there. Uh, and maybe even share accommodations. In, um, in the Texas Hill Country, in the Ozarks, there are a lot of sort of resorts, cabin, country places, small places, um, multiple bedroom places with kitchens. Uh, actually, these are things that probably predate Verbo and, uh, and Airbnb where groups would go primarily for the, during the summertime to get away from the city. But those kinds of places are available. Um, depending on the size of the group, you might have a, uh, a cabin or a, a whole large house or a, a, something that's specifically designed, not so much as a house, but as a group accommodation with a large kitchen area, and multiple bathrooms, things like that. Um, Travel buddies, uh, again, would just sort of be pairing up uh, as people tend to want to do. Um, trying to find out, as, as someone mentioned before, I had it on this list, finding out places that are preparing or organizations that are preparing for the event, uh, which might be either accommodations or astronomy clubs like TSP along the way. Um, and to some extent sharing equipment, which is probably not sharing equipment uh, like telescopes, but um, power supplies or just redundancy backup for each other if you travel to the, to the same area, um, if you're traveling to the same place that you might, might be able to share equipment and, and the shipping of equipment, making sure it gets there all right. Um, as far as... Um, things we could do not for each other, but for outsiders. We have the possibility, uh, I think, of Novak ordering in bulk eclipse glasses, maybe getting them underwritten by, a, by an advertiser, some local company, so that we could, in particular, give them out to uh, local schools and deserving organizations with whom Novak comes in contact, um, maybe doing it at the Astronomy for Everyone event. Um, it'd be a little bit of advertising for Novak, maybe a little bit of advertising for the underwriter. Um, I've checked into preliminarily what these things cost. They're not very expensive to do it um, and get certified safe eclipse classes. Now, of course, that would be something to do before the partial eclipse because the um, the October or the annual eclipse. The October annual eclipse will be 30% in Washington. And um, that's enough to get people's attention. And in particular, it's, uh, it's enough to deserve having eclipse classes. So people are not tended to stare at the, uh, at the eclipse through just plain sunglasses. Just, just um, a uh, quick note, you know, there, there's a good company uh, called Rainbow Symphony that can make customized eclipse glasses. Like you could, you could design one with the Novak logo, and uh, I'm not sure what the you know the price would be, but or doing something like that in bulk would be, you know, nice uh, outreach. And yeah, I I, I checked with them, and I checked with a couple other places already, right. um, and they're all um, they're all well below a dollar each, um, and I think um, we could come up. I, I think it'd be possible for the club to partially underwrite it hopefully get a commercial outfit to also underwrite it such that we could give them away to, um, to uh, people. And, um, and maybe for the cases where it's not worth giving them away, maybe charge a dollar, not because we need the dollar, but because if you charge people a dollar, they're less likely to throw it away. If you get away for free, then they think it's not worth anything. Um, now, along the same lines, we could produce a data sheet for use locally that explains to people primarily what they'll see in Washington with these two eclipses 
and some basic information that they could use if they wanted to travel towards the center line, just awareness information. Again, from the, from the point of view of Novak. Uh, and thirdly, we could try to get some Novak members who are um, somehow familiar or have personal experiences with eclipses to talk about the eclipses to groups in the area. We're already getting requests for the spring for people to come talk at various things and the top and the eclipse would be a good topic. So in order to, or any more comments on, on outreach ideas? Okay. So here's my list of what people could do to, um, to make these things happen. I think one of the primary things would be to get some sort of a discussion board that is organized in terms of the kind of mutual support we would wanna have. People who want to have people to just travel with together, people who wanna arrange uh, to share accommodations at a destination area. So this kind of a discussion board would need to be uh, stratified by destination areas and uh, a kind of, uh, kind of sharing desired. But it's basically a ride sharing board. You know, I'm interested in going to the Ozarks and I can take two people uh, and they're 14 inch dobs. Um, I'm, I'm interested in going to uh, uh, Cleveland and share a, um, an Airbnb and I don't want to travel with anybody, but if you're getting out there on your own, we could share a place. Um, so that's one, that's one kind of an opportunity. And let me start now and saying, is there anybody who's willing to do and manage that kind of, a, of an activity? Now, in some of these things, if you don't want to speak up now, you can contact me afterwards and talk about it. But I think what's going to happen is clearly if nobody volunteers to do this, then we'll just go back to the free for all on, uh, on the travel SIG of people sending messages and, and uh, catch as catch can. Uh, I was hoping that we would be able to get this a little bit more organized because it could get quite complex. Okay, so let me go down the list. Um, to, to look at whether there's any kind of an opportunity to get shared transportation to any of the potential observing areas. Now, one of the things I did not do intentionally in the survey was ask people where they wanted to go because I thought it was too, too early to do that. Maybe people will come up with ideas or more, more clear in their own minds how much time and, and where they'd like to go versus uh, the probability of, of clear skies. Uh, once that's done, then we can start talking about, is there any demand for uh, some way to, to share transportation to some of the more distant places? Um, along the lines of uh, the, uh, the, the uh, the suggestion to find out what local groups are doing, collecting planning resources, which includes um, the kind of support available from destination towns and, and uh, campgrounds and, uh, and parks. Um, people to research the destination facilities. We talked a little bit about that before and the groups that are out there doing things. Um, for future meetings, like to have people specifically plan to talk a little bit about what they did, not in not in um, not in extremely brief terms, but talk a little bit about their end-to-end -end experience, what they did right, what they did wrong in going to an eclipse, what they've learned from going to multiple eclipses. And as we get into specialty areas, 
talk about observing techniques and uh, astrophotography techniques. Um, someone to draft a handout that, that Novak could use about the basics of eclipses and what the partial eclipses will look like in the Washington area. And someone to convert collected wisdom that we get at discussions or people post into something that could go on Novak websites, not just uh, the listservs or the SIG. Anybody going to step forward and volunteer to do any of these things at this point? Well, this may be a short undertaking. Okay. Hi, Alan. This is uh, Greg. I'd be glad to uh, capture my experiences on the eclipse. It was very exciting for me. It was my first ever eclipse, my first ever photographing an eclipse. And uh, there were all sorts of lessons learned and experiences that, uh, that hopefully I will benefit from on a second eclipse. Okay. Well, I'm thinking, and I think it, it may be the, the next slide talk about oh, next meeting. Alan? But yeah, let me, um, Chris, before, before, we, before we lose that idea, I think at one of the meetings, maybe have three or four individuals um, talk a little bit in depth about their experience at eclipses for the benefit of everybody. Um, separate, probably separate from some in-depth on the phases of an eclipse and what, what you can expect to see and what you can expect to do visually. Uh, somebody else wanted to say something? Yeah, Alan's Chris. Um, I mean, I can help with, you know, uh, some of the, the documentation, you know, getting some of the document put together. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I may not have the, all the detailed information in my fingertips, but I can work with somebody to, you know, organize it on a page and make it, make it presentable and, you know, easy to print and hand out. Is, is that Chris Spain? It's Chris Kagey. Oh, okay, good. Chris, this is Dan Ward. I, I pulled together some material for MITRE for 2017 that uh, using documents from the American Astronomical Association, from NASA, and from a federation of uh, science teachers. And such. There's a lot of really good safe uh, eclipse viewing material there. I still have copies of that stuff somewhere. So I'll, I'll work with you, Chris. There's, there's a, yeah, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a heck of a lot of good data out there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I just throw my head into the you know in terms of experiences. I've been to you know a number of eclipses. You know, I've actually eleven now. So uh, you know, I mean, a lot of them were with with groups. You know, traveling around the world. But you know, there were of course twenty seventeen too. But anyway, you know, when we get to that point of of having people uh, add in their experiences and lessons learned, I could help with that too. Okay. Well, um, and. and Put it down, I'm not taking extensive notes, put it down in the chat and um, that way we'll be able to follow up and make sure we, we capture all of this. And Alan, if you are gonna have a group of people present at a Novak meeting, I would highly recommend they coordinate ahead of time and divide up the topics that they're gonna talk about so that we don't recycle the same material four times from four different people, rather have people talk about, you know, different aspects of the experience, even if they collect and aggregate information from the group to do it. Just have somebody be a lead on travel, somebody be a lead in equipment, somebody be a lead on photographing, you know, and keep it tight that way. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about it as, uh, as something to do for this interest group and record more so than Novak meetings. I'm not sure. Um, yep. You know, there might be one in which we go over sort of summaries of, of deliberations of this group for the, for the broader group and maybe motivate some interest. But I'm thinking of this as being primarily the people who plan on going to the Eclipse Center line um, and, and observing 
seriously, let me say. Gotcha. So, and yes, certainly coordinate it. That's what I'm saying. And when I said get, get three or four people, uh, yeah, certainly not all saying the same thing, but do, but actually keeping it personal, not, um, not academic, not lecturing it, you know, but the fun parts, yeah. talking about the people, talking about the experience, um, not just the um, what if ratio and I and ISO setting with the camera. We'll have enough of that. Okay. So that leads to next meetings. Um, I would say nominally once a month do this. Um, does that make sense to people? There's not a lot, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of uh, preparation required. Um, there are things to do to generally support the people who would want to go and share Novak resources. But um, uh, I think rather get the experiences out and some introductory and some uh, observing hints to the first timers in particular, get that out as early as possible. And then we can decide how to continue later on. But um, I, I think we need to get this going as soon as possible. And as I said, give the first, ter first timers the information they need to think about what they're going to do. Um, and then they can, they can figure out other ways to, to to get better about it and, and talk to experienced people in the club. Uh, does once a month seem okay as midweek? I mean, obviously people here have been able to attend on a Thursday night. So I would expect that uh, most of the people now would say, well, Thursday nights work. But uh, I'm not sure if that's good for everybody. I guess it would be my inclination to do Tuesdays or Thursdays uh, at 7.30. What do people say about that? Nothing. Yeah, I, I would mean, prefer Thursday only because I have a standing commitment on Tuesdays. But I know there was someone else who had planned to attend on Tuesday, but has a meeting on Thursday. So... Yeah, yeah can't I know. Please, everyone. <laughs> right, we can't play, and you know, I don't, I don't know what the answer is going to be. Um, I think um, we will post this, and um, the people who said they couldn't make it tonight, I specifically got back to them and said, "Yes, we will post it." Um, and um, yeah, so let me let me say we'll we'll try to do it about every four or five weeks between NOVAC meetings and uh, general, me general meetings and have this as a separate exercise uh, in, uh, in exchanging information. And under the what on this slide is what I suggest to be the, the next three meetings, one uh, from the members, uh, people who volunteer to present, uh, the next one being step-by-step step what the eclipse is like and what to expect to observe. Um, I don't know if that's a, a full topic. And then finally, talk about photography, which is potentially quite complicated. And there, I would hope to get help from, in all of these I expect help, but especially in that one, uh, help from experienced astrophotographers not in how hard you can make it, but what a beginner could expect to do. Uh, I will say that one of the advantages of uh, uh, photography of a solar eclipse is that any exposure will work because the corona goes from very bright at the inside edge to very dim at the outside. And you can't fail to get something. Um, so, uh, to that extent, you can just you can just take your iPhone and do it. But there are some other issues about 
what focal length and what kind of a camera you have uh, to get a reasonable film scale, plate scale um, with, um, with the sun and to include the corona, which can extend quite a bit outside and some other topics about optical cleanliness and tracking, and, uh, some other things which are a little bit different from, from normal astrophotography. So um, yes, yeah, so we can handle that. So I'll plan on scheduling that, letting people know, uh, again, through Novak announcement. And um, I would like people to contact me about the kinds of activities they think they could support and help with. Otherwise, I think I'm just gonna take them off the list because um, this is not an exercise in making work for me or coming up with ideas for somebody else to do. Um, this is an opportunity for NOVAC members to step up and uh, do the part of our, of our motto that is not only to observe, but to help others observe. And this is an opportunity for people to, to pitch in and do not only what they're going to need to do for themselves, but to something that helps other people get ready for the eclipse. So with that, uh, I've got a slide and I posted these, I, I sent out. Here are some, here's the reference list from the American Astronomical Society, which looks pretty good. Um, this interactive Google map by Javier Jouvier from France, um, is very good about allowing you to, um, to see exactly the observing conditions, any place along the eclipse path and any, anywhere across the eclipse path to see how close to the central, center line you need to be to get most of the duration. Uh, you don't fall off a cliff if you're not exactly on the middle of the, of the center line, but you don't wanna be on the edge. Now I will mention that um, David Dunham suggested he would like people to be on the edge because he looks, uh, I'll speak for him, he looks at the eclipse as a kind of occultation. And in all these occultations, he wants to measure how good the prediction was. So he would like people to be on the edge, which is a, uh, I think a largely futile request because at the edge you get about well, you get nothing, but you can get two seconds of totality and then you're out of it. But um, there are some opportunities for citizen science. And I think Dan, Dan was pointed out to me, the, um, there's, a, there's a plan to come up with a movie of the sun for the entire duration of the eclipse by equipping people with uniform camera setups all along the path so they can follow it for whatever it is, a couple hours and make a movie of the sun and its changes during the course of the eclipse. Um, so you're, uh, you'd be wise to, to look at these references and um, you can find the answers to a lot of specific questions. Uh, and I think that's all I had, well, that's a lot. So we, we got a little bit more time. I was sort of figuring on going until nine Anybody else have something they want to contribute or, uh, or ask the group? No? Hey, Ellen, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, it's Richard. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I enjoyed the presentation. It's a good effort. Um, I just have an added wrinkle the last time. In 2017, I went to Charleston, and when my family learned what was going on, they all wanted to come. We rented an Airbnb place, and, and we observed from that house. So another wrinkle is instead of everybody gearing up with all their stuff, there may be some who, when they get their family excited, they want to go too. So anyway, just a thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ellen, this is Greg. I just want to mention that I think one of the benefits of having this kind of discussion is one, introduce uh, to people who are not familiar with eclipses and have never been some of the background and some of the information they need to know 
associated with with getting there uh, and and uh, what kind of features to see and how best to see it and that sort of thing. But the other thing is everybody has different experiences and has different setups and has different uh, ideas and recommendations and uh, everyone benefits uh, from sharing that. And uh, I'm not sure whether you, it sounds like you wanna put us all to work. I'm not sure that I'm into being put to work, but I am interested in sharing my experiences and helping others and also learning myself. Yeah, I, I know not everybody, not everybody can do it, um, but uh, it's also not a situation that if nobody does it, it doesn't get done. So um, uh, it's, it's not that I'm interested in putting people to work. I think I'm set myself. So uh, it's just a question of mutual assistance. Uh, I, I did this session so that we could get started, um, look at options, and, you know, I I made a lot of statements and made a lot of proposals, but uh, if other people want to propose doing something different, um, now one of the one of the things I like is for people, you know, as I said in one of the sessions, I I guess I should have amended it and saying you know we'd have three or four people talk about in detail their experiences, but other people can add. Now it's not just a question of what you've used, but a critical evaluation of what you've done that worked and didn't work. Um, and there are some experts in the group who can probably comment on things that are appropriate and things that are not appropriate for this kind of, of observing. Uh, clearly big telescopes are not appropriate. They, they don't help, they don't, uh, they don't show you something. And, when you look at the corona, you're gonna be looking at something which is up to three degrees across. So um, you, need, you need something wide field. And uh, that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm prejudging what people would say later on. But um, a high resolution, faint fuzzy camera setup is probably not the right thing to bring. And um, I don't know, people will have different experiences. Uh, last eclipse, I just went with a 300 millimeter uh, sitting on a not very high quality digital camera. And, uh, and I did pretty well on a tracking mount. And, um, and I flew out there and it was something I could, I could easily manipulate. Uh, other people would bring a lot more equipment and uh, take a lot better pictures. Um, but you can't beat a good pair of binoculars for actually looking at the eclipse. And um, I think this is an opportunity not only for us to do better for ourselves, but to, uh, as I said in one of those slides, I would like Novak, I would hope that Novak could help the community uh, in, in understanding what's, company, uh, what's coming and, uh, and getting people in the community ready to observe both the uh, the partial phases of both the annular and the total eclipses. So that's why I think there are opportunities for people to help and uh, to fulfill the mission of the club. I think your comment about the eclipse glasses and being able to get those underwritten and perhaps some advertising on them is a really good one. It seems kind of uh, uh, not unimportant, but it, it seems kind of low level right now but I remember for 2017, within about two months of the eclipse, they were like hen's teeth. You couldn't find them. And in fact, at that time, they had all sorts of scandals about people making counterfeit uh, 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 eclipse glasses. And, and it, it, was, it was just a real tough time. So that's, that's, why, we need, that's why we need to do it now. There's already yeah. a lead time on getting them. Yeah, uh, and if we were to get if if we were to get them underwritten by someone, um, I mean we've got to make those contacts now. Because yeah, I, <clears throat> I would like to piggyback on what Greg just said that uh, for for all the press about uh, uh, fake eclipse glasses, they didn't actually find any. What happened there were some American eclipse manufacturers got pretty pissed off at Chinese eclipse manufacturers underpricing them. 
and they started a whole series of interviews saying these have not been certified. And it was correct. They had not been a certified by the U.S. group. They had been certified by a Chinese group. So, you know, I mean, China doesn't basically want to bribe their people either. But 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 there was all this hullabaloo and it ended up being a lot of negative marketing back and forth. And, uh, you know, we I don't doubt we will see the same kinds of BS this time around, too. Right. So the so the issue would be to find out how to fund a project to um, identify the supplier, which I think is not that hard at this point, uh, decide if we want it printed or just plain and uh, and what kind of information would we distribute with it so that we could help the community do the job right. We can't supply everybody, but um, we could do a portion of it because we have the knowledge. Right? Dan Ward can testify we had a lot of a lot of craziness running around because um, our, uh, our employer was concerned that um, he might be distributing fake uh, uncertified or unsafe classes. And the, as you say, the, uh, the fear was unfounded, but it was a real fear. And if anything, people are more afraid of certification and government people and handouts and things like that now than they were in 2017. So, um, you know, it'd be nice for us to, to do the right thing by our community. Back in 1970, we didn't have things like eclipse classes. When I went down to Virginia Beach to watch the total eclipse there, what we had was we took this shoe box and we cut a viewing port in the top of the shoe box at one end and poked a pinhole in the other. So yeah, that's just information you can tell to people. It's not... You know, if you don't have eclipse classes, watch it this way. Right. And there there are online, there are resources. Uh, what is it called? A funnel projection thing. There's a, there's a thing you can make to go on the back of a simple telescope uh, that makes it capable of eyepiece projection onto literally a funnel that you, that you affix to, uh, to the back of a telescope. But you can do pinhole camera kind of things or all kinds of projects that kids can do and uh, learn something a little bit about optics, about pinhole cameras. Uh, in uh, addition, of course, in 1970, we also had uh, X-ray film and, uh, and negatives, which were perfectly fine. I want to mention, uh, if, if you saw Phil Harrington's talk on Sunday night, uh, one of the things he showed, he showed his eclipse pictures and he says his, his favorite two uh, clips uh, photos were pictures of his grandkids using a what's called a safe solar viewer. Uh, I talked to Phil after that. He sent me the, the links on that. And uh, I've, I've actually had a conversation with Guy, Guy Brandenburg, who you know, runs our telescope making workshops in D.C. And we're, we're looking at doing a session there. You can buy the optics that Phil used for five bucks. And then you need a couple of pieces of wood and you can build uh, the same thing that he was showing with his kids. Uh, so for, for 10 bucks, you could build a really nice uh, safe solar projection device. And to, you know, so there are lots of different ways to do it safely. Uh, that was kind of a cool thing. If you haven't seen Phil's talk, I recommend uh, looking on the YouTube channel, the Novak YouTube channel and watching it because he has some pretty cool stuff, especially in the first 30 minutes. Hey, Alan. I, is there a, uh, a time limit of those solar glasses? I thought they expired after a couple of years. I had some no. left over from 17. They're still good? No, no. They're perfectly stable. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what might have any kind of an expiration unless it was made out of gelatin, but these are not made out of gelatin. They're, uh, well, there are two different, they're two different formulations, but. Basically, the shiny stuff, if the shiny stuff is still there, it's it's still neutral density six. Yeah, I got mine from Lunt Solar Systems, a bunch of them to hand out. So, Yeah, well, people might remember I bought bulk, um, uh, and I still have some, uh, eight-inch roll, which I cut up for members um, for, uh, for a discount. Actually, I got it for the transit of Venus and solar eclipse and everything else. Um, 
but I got it large enough so people could put it on a telescope, either as a full aperture filter or a sub aperture filter for larger telescopes. But uh, no, that, that, that film doesn't uh, expire. Thank you. Yeah, it's good that you kept the, the glasses. I'm happy okay. now. <laughs> okay, well, it's nine o'clock. Um, I, I think it's probably time to call it quits uh, unless anyone has other comments. Uh, Chris Kagey has volunteered to, uh, to do the heavy listing, lifting of um, posting this on the Novak YouTube channel. Pamela, as always, has volunteered to do the editing to, uh, to eliminate any craziness, which I don't think we have too much of. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll get it posted for those who missed and uh, we'll plan on doing this again in four or five weeks. And um, I hope to, to line up some people with experiences and as, as, uh, as was suggested, we'll do a little coordination about uh, what people wanna talk about, which parts of their experience so they're not all talking about the same thing. Um, and everybody can add their comment about the one piece of equipment which they forgot to bring. Uh, that always happens, but uh, plan on bringing N plus one so that when you only have N, you've got enough. All right, well, thanks everybody for attending. Um, looks like we had about 30 people, which is pretty good. And um, We'll see you again in about, well, we'll see you at the, at the general meeting in a, in a couple of weeks and then, uh, and then this and a few more. Thanks again, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Thanks Alan. Meeting. Really Thanks, good. Alan. Thanks, Alan. Oh, good night. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Alan.